Occupy Wall Street, if you remember that, it seems like everything has moved on very quickly now, either by the system or whatever. But when I was growing up as a young man, I mean, I had Martin Luther King there for 10 years screaming and yelling, saying we need to love each other, but we need to debate, we need to talk. Where are those people today? I just don't see them. They're just not, they're not out there. They're not trying to raise mass awareness. And with the way the system's developed today, it's gonna to be very, very difficult. I'm just telling people with the internet, which has basically created a global society just by its existence. And we can go into that different, you know, the NSA is heavily involved in the internet with Google and stuff. And they don't want people that talk back, no. The government does not want people to talk back. The government wants people to march in lockstep. That's why it's called a government. They want control. We're here at the Harland Report with John Whitehead. You are a constitutional attorney here in the United States and the president and founder of the Rutherford Institute, in which you examine, out of many things, the militarization of America domestically. Mm -hmm. uh, and you speak at length in your book, A Government of Wolves, also on the lack of respect for the Constitution and the development in the United States in which there now is a dramatic lack of respect for central freedoms in the United States Constitution. We're going to talk a little bit about this in this program, the, the censorship, the state of liberal progressive censorship. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from and how did a free country such as America, a democratic country, develop into this? Abraham Lincoln said it, what one generation uh, learns in school that practices than the next generation. So obviously through the educational system, which uh, over the years in this country has obviously used the word dumbed down, especially in terms of rights and thinking. Um, Political correctness, in other words, and I think George Carlin, the great uh, comedian, not really a comedian, commentator I call him, he just said political correctness is uh, fascism pretending to be manners. And that's what we're seeing. It's, I would call it language fascism. Limiting the number of words that we speak, and this is the key is, how we express our, our, our thoughts are through words. If you reduce words or what people can say, you reduce thoughts. If you reduce thoughts, you reduce thinking. A non-thinking populace is one that will very easily go heil and or follow a leader very easily, no matter who that leader is. And so what we're seeing, in my opinion, is, and I can use the word programming, it's a form of programming, all, all uh, reality is socially created. I mean, it's either by uh, parents, government, teachers, or whatever. People who want people to think give them lots of opportunities and lots of words to use, and they create debate. That's why in our First Amendment it says you have a right to free speech, you have a right to peacefully assemble and petition your government for a redress of grievances. And what that means is you get on the sidewalk and say, I don't like what you're doing, I'm not voting for you, or I'm going to try to get rid of you the next election, and I ain't taking this anymore. And today, I mean, you don't see people doing that so much as running into each other's faces and saying you shouldn't be saying that word and pointing at each other. And I keep saying if you're pointing at each other in a public sphere, you're pointing at the wrong people. You should be pointing at the government. That's the person who's going to take your freedom away. And uh, George Orwell maybe said it best. He, could, he controls the past, controls the future, but he who controls the future controls the present. And what we're seeing is uh, history being erased in this country, you can't say, talk about certain historical figures, they're automatically, ooh, they're tearing down monuments in this country all over the place. You can't just go to a monument and say, I disagree with that guy and what he did. No, it's tear it down and get rid of it. And when people today stop, and they're stopping, they're, they're not thinking, in my opinion. Uh, the average American watches 151 hours of screen devices a month, the average American. And what that says is, 
you don't, you're not thinking. And let me explain that further. Hitler said it best, and I, I quote Hitler in, in uh, Battlefield America in my book. He said, if I can get people in groups marching, I've got them, they stop thinking. Well, what's the biggest group thing you do today? Watching screen devices. So you get people in groups, they stop thinking. What happens to, by the way, and this is a biological uh, fact, your prefrontal lobe here, which is the analytical part of your mind, if it's not challenged, it just goes to sleep. And it just, you're not thinking. And what uh, the freedom fighters do in this country, people I've defended over the years, is they encourage people to think. They might say the wrong word. They might do the wrong thing in terms of what many people think. But at least it makes you think. And here's the key. Your perception of reality may be incorrect. So you need someone to debate with occasionally, whether it's your wife or your husband, <laughs> your next door neighbor, or the guy on the street, or the woman on the street, or whatever. And uh, that's what we need. I keep telling people we need more debate. We don't need it just in the United States. We need it all over the world. We need people standing up and saying, I disagree. But the thing is, if we are to be allowed to disagree, there has to be a respect for one of the foundational values of the conservative movement following Edmund Burke in the 1700s and 1800s and his line of thought, saying the respect for diversity mm -hmm. the, and, and the embrace of differences, yes. both racial differences, this is the Political beauty yes. of how God created the world. Yeah. Some of us are black, some of us are brown, some of us are as white as almost blue. I mean, it's a beauty that some of us come from Africa, some from Asia, yep. but today we seem to fight that. And that group think is very strong in, in Europe as well, and we come from Scandinavia and see it's like a total controlling system there. Uh, and we're socialists there, of course, and the group thing, to get everybody into groups, is one of the major points in both communism mm -hmm. and socialism. And we saw how communism ended up in the Soviet Union. Yep. They had an elite, didn't they? It wasn't the rule of the people. No, it wasn't. No. There was an elite that took everything. There was an elite that structured everything and a government structure. And everybody were employed by the government as yeah. well, thus creating a whole population that would never object because if you object, stop you lose your job. Yes. We're seeing it today with uh, what we're seeing in our schools today, what we're seeing in general debate on television, I'm seeing, and things like that. But, um, you know, the key is with surveillance capitalism, which we have today, if, you, if people, your people understand that term. But what it means is, is that what we're seeing on Facebook with artificial intelligence now basically getting into the Internet and running a lot of it is this idea that they study everything you do what you think, what you think, and then they tailor everything to you. In other words, you're just getting something delivered to you like a package, a package of thoughts. You're not getting someone going, hey, what you said was stupid. You need to think. You're getting someone trying to turn you into a meta metadata, basically, data bits, and control how you think. And when I see young people today, and I, when, I, when we go into a restaurant and I see a mother and a father and three kids are all doing this, when I'm going, I want to yell over to the table and say, hey, why don't you guys talk for a while and <laughs> debate what's on your phone and stop looking all the time. Because they do want you looking. As long as you're looking, you're not reacting. You're not thinking. I go back to what Hitler said. He said, if I can get people into groups marching or into groups, I can control them because they stop thinking. And that's basically what we're seeing happening today. And... Um, the, the lone freedom fighter out there is becoming more of a lone freedom fighter, I'm saying. The one out there who wants to take a stand. I'm hoping that there's going to be an upsurge here or there. I see Occupy Wall Street, if you remember that, four or five years ago. It lasted for, it tend, the movements tend to last now three months and they move on. It seems like everything has moved on very quickly now, either by the system or whatever. But when I was growing up as a young man, I mean, I had Martin Luther King there for 10 years screaming and yelling about freedom and saying we need to love each other, but we need to debate, we need to talk. Where are those people today? I just don't see them. They're, just not, they're not out there. They're not trying to raise mass awareness. And with the way the system's developed today, it's going to be very, very difficult. I'm just telling people with the Internet, 
which has basically created a global society just by its existence. And we can go into that different, you know, the NSA is heavily involved in the internet with Google and stuff, the, the national spy and the CIA. And they don't want people that talk back, no. The government does not want people to talk back. The government wants people to march in lockstep. That's why it's called a government. They want control. And in the end, they want money. They want your money, your tax money. Like I say, the average American pays more in taxes than for food and shelter in this country today, while the rich don't pay taxes. And that's a, a remarkable development in the West because since the 1990s, uh, we have seen a surge of globalism, unprecedented. And this international economic uh, model is based on other values than the nation state oh, yeah. capitalist system. Yeah. And it has led to uh, the rise of the ultra rich yes. in a way that we just have never seen before. Yeah. I think Oxfam states that around 60 people now own or more than 50% of world assets. Yes. It's based on a system too that refuses to redistribute wealth when outsourcing jobs. Yes. And at the same time, of course, don't pay taxes, let's say to the United States. No. They're at the Bahamas and all when kinds Jeff of Bezos places. Jeff Bezos is not paying federal income tax. He's the richest man in the world and he operates in this country. Plus, he has a six, $600 million contract. He's created the intelligence cloud for all the intelligence agencies in this country. Most people don't realize that. He has a $10 billion contract with the Pentagon and working with their systems. Now, he's making a lot of money off of me, the taxpayer. I pay my taxes. If I didn't, I'd go to jail. Would they put me out of business? He doesn't pay federal income taxes. Now, what did Jimmy Carter say? We live in an oligarchy. What did the Princeton University, the Northwestern University say? say? We live in an oligarchy run by a money to elite. We don't live in a democracy in America. We don't live in a republic. We live in an oligarchy run by people with a lot of money. That's a proven fact now when you have the universities and you have the, a former president saying it, yes. And it's a We want to say it's conspiracy stuff, but it's not. It's facts. And it can be proven. It's a paradox to us Europeans to note that your uh, federal banks are privately yes, owned yeah. at the top levels. Yeah. Many are not aware of that, uh, how that whole system came to be. And looking at Eisenhower also... And that goes back to 1913, yes. Yes, yes. And Eisenhower, how he spoke about the dangers of the military industry and the economic yeah. uh, systems taking over democracy in such a way that there is no more rule of the people, but we may see the re-entry of a middle age kind of feudalist system. Oh, it's very much a feudal system, yes. But it was that from the beginning in this country. The people who wrote the Constitution, at the time the Constitution was written, 90% of the population were agrarian farmers. They were poor people. The system always has been run eventually with people with money, but there were a bunch of folks in the colonies at the time, in the 1790s, that said, hey, we got to have a Bill of Rights or we're going to fight this thing, this Constitution you've given us, and we got the Bill of Rights. And, and again, it goes back to the people. The people have to assert themselves. They have to protect their rights. It's lawyers like me that get out there and say, okay, you got arrested on the street corner there for yelling at a cop. I'll defend you, you know. And those are the good people, by the way. And I, I get people who tell me all the time, how can you defend that troublemaker? And I look at him and go, well, that troublemaker is the reason you have freedom. He's exercising his freedoms. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. And, and quickly redefine, please, for our audience to remember the Bill of Rights. What were the main freedoms presented in the American Constitution as the Bill of Rights to ensure that the America, America would be a democratic country based on civil liberties and civil rights? You know, the First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to peacefully assemble, and tell the government you don't like them. The Second Amendment, you have a right to own a fire and protect yourself against government agents. The third says you can't have the military running inside and taking over people's homes. The Fourth Amendment is very, very key. It says unreasonable search and seizure. The police just can't grab you and run into your homes and arrest you unless they have a warrant signed by a judge. 
it goes on through. You have a right to a trial. You have a right to a jury. And one of the key amendments is the 10th Amendment, which says that state governments can nullify acts of the federal government. They can pass laws and say, we're not going to follow. And a couple of states have done this, and this is key here. There's the National Defense Authorization Act, which has been in business. Obama ran it. Trump's running it. It allows the president to, if he thinks you're an extremist, he can go into your home arrest you with the military and put you in a detention camp where you can't see your lawyer or your family. This is in America today. Uh, several states have nullified that and say we will, we will not allow our National Guard or police to p participate in those programs. And that's the way to do it. It's interesting to see that the Nazi system was a national socialist exactly. system. Today in Europe, it's described now, it's uh, the extreme right-wing Hitler, the extreme right-wing Hitler. It was the extreme left-wing Hitler. It was the groupthink Hitler. Yep. It was the media total media censorship Hitler. It was the total control over the university systems and the professors and the intellectuals, the police, throwing uh, people yeah. in jail. We often talk about how Jews, many Jews, went into the concentration camps. We, we very often uh, forget that the same thing happened to the intellectuals at that time. Mm -hmm. And there was a broad silencing. Everybody was driving the same cars, everybody doing the same Heil, all of this. And in the post-war period, many of the same socialists and Marxists that ran in Germany and the Frankfurter School at that time, such as Herbert Marcuse, he moved to the West and to America, and he became the father of the 1960s cultural mm -hmm. revolution Marxist movement here in the United States. And he openly spoke about the need to curb freedom mm -hmm. for those groups that we, I guess that would be the Marxist culturalist, do not like. Yep. And they, in the Frankfurter School too, very carefully spoke about the need to change social structures mm -hmm. by force using language. Yeah, but also, and this is something most Americans don't know, and this is a fact, Project Paperclip, are you familiar with that? Yes. The United States brought in over a thousand top Nazis into this country, and they went into universities. Reinhard Galen, by the way, who was one of Hitler's chief intelligence agents, came in this country and helped set up the CIA in 1945. And if people, if you study your history in the 50s and early 60s, you had COINTELPRO, uh, uh, the FBI, going into people's homes, arresting people in the 50s. You had the House on American Activities Committee calling people in because they were protesting the government and they were supposed to be communists. And who did the Nazis fight? It was the communists they were trying to get rid of. We saw that in the early 60s, so that system kind of moved in. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that the influence it had has totally gone away, the Project Paperclip. I think that still has an influence. And we're seeing it in the FBI. And by the way, the FBI collected 17,000 pages of information on Martin Luther King. They followed him everywhere. An FBI agent actually wrote him a letter and said he should kill himself or they were going to turn him some of his private data over to the public. This is our government doing that to someone taking a stand for freedom. Uh, so that all that we're talking about here has go, it went back many, many years ago and has some very, very strange, weird influences. Bishop Harry Jackson, who's a regular guest uh, on the Herland Report shows, he asserts too that the civil rights movements with uh, Martin Luther King and others initially was not a movement for black people, to put it that way. But it was really a surge to get people to start thinking yes. and a surge actually for the return to values yes. that were in accordance with the Constitution. And the Declaration of Independence. And people yeah. also forget King, that Martin King Luther King... the Declaration King, of Independence a lot. Yes, yeah. he was a Christian. Yeah. He was a Christian yes, revivalist. He taught peace and love. But he also taught open dialogue, which is key. So thank you very much, uh, John Whitehead, for taking the time, president of the Rutherford Institute, constitutional attorney, <laughs> famous here in America, for taking the time to come here and talk to us about the genuine freedoms of the great American Constitution and the development of the American state today. Thank you. Thank you.